Hey everyone, before we start this video, I just wanted to mention that only 22% of you are subscribed. So if you enjoy regular Harry Potter content, please consider subscribing to support the channel. I make videos nearly every day. Welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. For today's video, I wanted to share something very special with you guys, which pertains to the existence of the Harry Potter world as a whole. I am of course talking about the original synopsis written by J.K. Rowling for the Harry Potter book, a huge piece of Harry Potter history. This was the same synopsis that J.K. Rowling submitted to Bloomsbury Publishing before the book was ever known. This was the synopsis that helped Bloomsbury Publishing to understand why this is something that they should publish. This synopsis eventually persuaded Bloomsbury to offer Rowling her first contract, and I think that it's interesting to see the roots of Harry Potter and what caused it to become the huge franchise that it is. The first Harry Potter book, The Philosopher's Stone, was published in 1997, and this synopsis dates back to 1995, meaning this predated the definitive existence of the magical world by two years. There were a full two years, and probably even more, when Harry Potter existed. The world just didn't know it yet. All it was at that time was a crumpled piece of paper with folded corners and tea stains. It's also worth mentioning that the original, original synopsis, i.e. the original paper, is actually on display at the History of Magic exhibit. Without further ado, let's begin to take a look at the original Harry Potter synopsis. Harry Potter lives with his aunt, uncle, and cousin, because his parents died in a car crash. Or so he has been told. The Dursleys don't like Harry asking questions. In fact, they don't seem to like anything about him, especially the very odd things that keep happening around him, which Harry himself can't explain. The Dursley's greatest fear is that Harry will discover the truth about himself, so when letters start arriving for him near his 11th birthday, he isn't allowed to read them. However, the Dursleys aren't dealing with an ordinary postman, and at midnight on Harry's birthday, the gigantic Rubius Hagrid breaks down the door to make sure Harry gets to read his post at last. Ignoring the horrified Dursleys, Hagrid informs Harry that he is a wizard, and the letter he gives Harry explains that he is expected at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in a month's time. This was a great way to open things up, because in just a few short lines it introduces a bit of mystery and a bit of magic. How did his parents actually die? What are the odd things that keep happening around him? Why did the Dursleys hate him so much? What do they mean not an ordinary postman? What is Hogwarts? To the Dursleys' fury, Hagrid also reveals the truth about Harry's past. Harry did not receive the scar on his forehead in a car crash. It is really the mark of the great dark sorcerer, Voldemort, who killed Harry's mother and father, but mysteriously couldn't kill him, even though he was a baby at the time. Harry is famous among the witches and wizards who live in secret all over the country, because Harry's miraculous survival marked Voldemort's downfall. So Harry, who has never had friends or family worth the name, sets off for a new life in the wizarding world. He takes a trip to London with Hagrid to buy his Hogwarts equipment, robes, wand, cauldron, beginner's draft, and potion kit, and shortly afterwards sets off for Hogwarts from King's Cross Station, platform 9 and 3 quarters, to follow in his parents' footsteps. This is where things get juicy. A dark sorcerer? Fame? A new life? What's a platform 9 and 3 quarters? You've got my attention. Harry makes friends with Ronald Weasley, sixth in his family to go to Hogwarts and tired of having to use second-hand spellbooks, and Hermione Granger, cleverest girl in the year and the only person in the class to know all the uses of dragon's blood. Together, they have their first lessons in magic. Astronomy up on the tallest tower at two in the morning. Herbology out in the greenhouses where the mandrakes and wolfsbane are kept. Potions down in the dungeons with the loathsome Severus Snape. Harry, Ron, and Hermione discovered the school's secret passageways, learn how to deal with Peeves the Poltergeist, and how to tackle an angry mountain troll. Best of all, Harry becomes a star player at Quidditch, wizard football played on broomsticks. What are all the uses of Dragon's Blood? Magic lessons in the tallest tower of the building? Herbology lessons with mandrakes and wolfsbane? Potions in the dungeons of the school? Secret passageways? Poltergeists? Angry mountain trolls? Quidditch? The wizard football? This paragraph is jam-packed. What interests Harry and his friends most, though, is why the corridor on the third floor is so heavily guarded. Following up a clue dropped by Hagrid, who, when he is not delivering letters, is Hogwarts gamekeeper, 
they discover that the only Philosopher's Stone in existence is being kept at Hogwarts, a stone with powers to give limitless wealth and eternal life. Harry, Ron, and Hermione seem to be the only people who have realized that Snape, the potions master, is planning to steal the stone, and what terrible things it could do in the wrong hands. For the Philosopher's Stone is all that is needed to bring Voldemort back to full strength and power. It seems Harry has come to Hogwarts to meet his parents' killer face to face, with no idea how he survived last time. What's in the third floor corridor? What is the Philosopher's Stone? Why hasn't anyone else noticed that Snape is crooked? Who is going to stop him? Who is Voldemort? And how is Harry Potter, the young boy who didn't even know what magic was the week prior, going to stop him? And that's the synopsis that sold Bloomsbury on Rowling, and well, Harry Potter in general. The day that Bloomsbury accepted Rowling is certainly an iconic piece of history, as the cultural impact that Harry Potter has had worldwide has been a phenomenon. However, in addition to the synopsis, what also sold Bloomsbury on Rowling was the daughter of Bloomsbury's founder and executive chief, Nigel Newton, who took the book home and gave it to his eight-year-old daughter, Alice. Alice read the existing chapters of the book, which went as far as Diagon Alley, and then wrote her verdict on a piece of paper. The original piece of paper, shown here, says the following. The excitement in this book made me feel warm inside. I think it is possibly one of the best books an eight, nine-year-old could read. Coming from an eight-year-old, that is pretty much the best review that you could get for your own novel. It's short, to the point, and basically gave Bloomsbury the best feedback they could have expected to hear. It basically gave them the green light to publish Rowling. However, Alice's gleaming review didn't prompt immediate action from Bloomsbury, and it wasn't until Nigel's daughter Alice began to pester her father for the remaining chapters of the original manuscript that he really began to take notice. The day after mentioning to her father that she wanted more, Bloomsbury held an acquisitions meeting, and in that meeting, Nigel Newton approved editor Barry Cunningham's proposal that the Philosopher's Stone be published by Bloomsbury. This was the biggest decision in children's publishing history, as Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone has sold more than 120 million, that's right, million, copies worldwide. And that's it for this video. Had you guys already seen this massively important piece of Harry Potter history, or is this news to you? For today, leave a comment related to your favorite aspect from the first Harry Potter book. Until next time, there is plenty to be learned, even from a bad teacher. What not to do, how not to be.